All right, good morning. Uh, all right, I appreciate the, uh, the enthusiasm today. All right, so I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and today the committee will hold oversight on the Astoria transformer explosion and the transition to a green grid. Uh, we will also hear uh, my legislation, intro 1318, that will require the city to, to prepare and submit a report on the feasibility of replacing existing in-city gas-fired power plants with battery storage, along with expedited replacement time frames if possible. Now, on December 27, 2018, an equipment malfunction at a Con Edison substation in Astoria caused a sustained arc flash discharge that temporarily lit the sky a brilliant blue dubbed the Astoria Borealis and some other things as well. <laughs> yeah, this accident not only caused great confusion and fear among everyone who saw their night sky turn blue, but caused a temporary power loss at Rikers Island, LaGuardia Airport, and along the Seven Line, and also residential neighborhoods throughout Queens. Although power was mostly restored within 30 minutes, Questions have been raised about whether grid-scale battery storage facilities would have been able to mitigate these outages. Uh, you know, there were a lot of jokes about this, from a gender reveal party gone wrong uh, to aliens, uh, but it was no laughing matter. Families across the street had their foundation shook. Families didn't know if they had to evacuate, didn't know the status of their air quality until hours later, and there was a great fear in our community that was unacceptable. You know, studies have also found that there is significant correlation between rates of hospitalization for respiratory diseases and individual proximity to, to a fossil fuel uh, power plant. This blue light was a spotlight, shining a light on the challenges that our communities in Queens share every single day. You know, these pollutants are being breathed in every single day. And taken in concert with the disproportionate likelihood that gas-powered power plants in New York City will be sited in economically disadvantaged communities or a majority-minority community, the importance of transitioning towards a system based on renewable energy with grid-scale battery storage is a matter of environmental justice. And there is a sustainable alternative to grid failures, battery storage. Uh, these power plants are not the way that we should power a city in the 21st century. It is now time for us to move away from gas-powered power plants and that infrastructure and build a renewable future. Uh, we have gone way too long to have these plants in you know, the Power Now plan in 2001, where they cited plants based on telling communities and all communities of color and, and, and economically challenged communities, they're only going to be three years. Well, that was 2001, and we're in the year 2019. I, I, a child born that year is now legal of age to vote. And to see that these plants are still cited in those neighborhoods is unacceptable. You know, our governor talked about a target to deploy 1,500 megawatts of energy storage by 2025 to help us achieve a clean energy standard goal of 50% of New Yorkers uh, from renewable sources by 2030. We need to meet, meet that commitment and do better. On, t on December 13th, the Public Service Commission issued an order calling for a comprehensive strategy to enable deployment of 1,500 megawatts of energy storage by 2025 and expanding battery storage to 3,000 megawatts by 2030. New York isn't alone. Uh, you know, this is not science fiction. The blue light may have seemed like it, but this is not. This is real life. We can do this. The technology exists, whether in California where they're putting out a plan to have battery storage cover over a million homes, whether you see power providers throughout the country uh, putting, out, you know, putting out plans for uh, clean energy by 2030, 2040, 2050, these apparatus, the, these renewable energy choices are there, they're real, we can do this. And intro 1318 
will help us get there by drawing us that map. Uh, if we have a map, we know how, how to get where we're going. And intro 1318 would mandate a report by the mayor's office of sustainability or any such office the mayor may designate on the feasibility of utilization of renewables with battery storage to replace those in-city gas-powered power plants. This report must include expedited timeframes for indicating when such replacement should take place should the replacement of existing plants and power plants with renewable battery storage be found to be possible. And we know it can. Uh, a renewable future is not going to happen of its own accord. New York City is planning on working with our state partners, uh, the Public Service Commission, the Long Island Power Authority, uh, NICE CERTA, uh, all of our po you know, power authorities that are here today. Uh, you know, we, are, we need to transition to renewable sources and assure the, our communities a renewable future. Um, so I look forward to hearing uh, from Con Edison and uh, Natural Grid, National Grid today. And I want to recognize uh, my colleague from Brooklyn, uh, Carlos Menchaca, who is here and a member of the committee. <laughs> so with that, we're going to call the first panel. So Kyle uh, Kimball from Con Edison, good to see you again. And uh, Malavon Blair from Con Edison as well. All right, gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide comments today. My name is Milvan Blair. I'm the Senior VP of Central Operations at Con Edison, responsible for the electric transmission system. And I'm joined by my colleague, Kyle Kimball, Vice President of Government Affairs and Government and Community Affairs. Our comments today are focused both on the incident that occurred at our, our, our Astoria East substation on the evening of December 27, 2018, and intra 1318, which would require the city to study the use of renewable energy sources with battery storage to replace in city gas fired power plants. So, first, I would like to provide some more detail on the incident that caused a dramatic blue light in the sky that understandable cause concern in Astoria and our region. At approximately 9.12 p.m. on December 27, 2018, an electrical fault, a malfunction as you said, on a section of 138,000 volt equipment in one of our Astoria substations caused a sustained electrical arc flash, creating the blue light that was seen. The intense blue light combined with the low co cloud cover that night increased the incident visibility across the city. The equipment that malfunction is associated with voltage monitoring within the substation relay system that did not work properly. As a result of the malfunction, there was a transmission disturbance that caused a brief voltage dip. So far, we have replaced the faulty equipment. We have installed a redundant system and are working directly with the manufacturer to minimize the chance of this happening again. We sincerely apologize and deeply regret the disruption to our customers and the concern and confusion caused by this visibility. Due to the transmission disturbance, LaGuardia Airport and other customers went to their backup power system. Some customers throughout Queens served by the substation might have experienced a momentary voltage dip and would have seen their lights flicker with no loss of power. Thankfully, the incident did not cause any significant injuries or result in damage to personal property. The arc flash burnt itself out and FDNY did not, did not need to enter the premises. They were there, but they did not enter the premises. There were no impacts to air quality. A small amount of oil used as a coolant tested substantially below any level of concern and was contained on the site and cleaned up. The affected transmission equipment in our substation transformed high voltage electricity to a low voltage so that it can be used in your homes and businesses. Typically, we use 120 volts in, in our system, and that's what it, Trans substation allows. 
The substation is wholly, wholly owned by Con Edison and sits within the same complex as a privately owned Astoria generating plant. I just want to make clear that Con Edison does not own any power generation facility in Astoria. It is important to note that this incident would have occurred regardless of how electricity was generated. So even if we had solar and wind farms need substations to transmit power to the customers, this incident would have occurred even if the power supply was 100% renewable green energy. On intro 1318, we'll now provide some comments which requires the city to study transitioning power plants that use natural grass to renewable and storage. Let me assure you, Con Edison fully support the transition of cleaner energies, a transition that is already underway at Con Edison. We believe that careful planning, wise decision making, and the strategic use of new technologies we can build an energy system that will be cleaner and more efficient. We know that our customer wants clean and reliable el electricity and affordable. We have to work together to get to a cleaner and affordable energy future. Con Edison asks this committee and the council at large for your strong support and collaboration for the following prerequisite strategies programs and investment to get to our energy clean future. Renewables. Would like your support for our recently launched shared solar program that will install solar panels on our facilities, including in Astoria, and use the resulting bill credits to give monthly discount to low income customers so that our clean energy future is accessible to everyone. Utility ownership at large scale renewable generation take advantage of low cost capital and other business synergies. The development of the necessary transmission infrastructure to deliver that renewable energy to New York City. Technology to empower smart energy choices and we can see the changes are happening. Making energy efficiency programs and non-wire solution a growing and important part of our core business smart meter technology and implementation, investments and programs to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. Finally, we ask for your support to ensure the, that battery storage, which improve grid resiliency and reliability, is permitted by the FDNY and DOB and becomes an integral part of our energy structure. Another way we are helping to support New York's 80 by 50 goals is our jointly funded study called Energy Infrastructure Pathways to Achieve 80 by 50 with Nat National Grid and the City of New York through the Mayor's Office. The scope of this study is to develop and assess at least three parts to achieve the 80 by 50 goals and the cost of these parts that could be borne by our customers. Our expectation is that the study will also identify key regulations, laws, and policies that could be modified or adopted to accelerate progress towards this goal. For New York City to meet their short and long-term carbon reduction goals, we need a major increase in large-scale renewable energy. We think it makes sense to let customers own and operate these large-scale renewable sources through their utilities. They can be constructed by private developers, but the financing and operating costs will be cheaper by, for our customers if utilities own them as utility ownership means, a guaranteed source of renewable energy, lowering costs, and increasing union jobs. Through our clean energy subsidiary, Con Edison is the second largest solar energy producer in North America. With 2,600 megawatts of renewable assets in 17 states, Con Edison has assets avoid 5.4 million tons of carbon dioxide emission, the equivalent of taking 1.2 million cars off the road. 
I know it's a common misconception that Con Edison generates all the power that its customers use. Since deregulation occurred in the 1990s, our regulated utility business serving the New York region is currently not allowed to, to generate power. We are primarily a distribution business, with the exception of our steam generating facilities in which we co-generate steam and electricity. Co-generation means we simultaneously produce steam and electricity using the same amount of fuel. This district steam system provides numerous environmental benefits, including co-generation and the avoidance of on-site boilers, on boilers for individual buildings. Our steam system generating plants, which consider a power plant, produces steam for over 1,600 buildings, affecting 3 million people throughout Manhattan. Steam provides a unique environmental benefit to help transition New York City to carbon reduction goals we all share. Large property owners and policymakers alike widely recognize steam as an important tool for carbon reduction. Two examples are recognition of lead points for building that use district steam and the city of New York mandating the use of steam for new buildings that take advantage of the recent East Midtown rezoning. We believe steam is a part of the solution for many of our customer energy and sustainability goals and the city itself. And this building being a Con Edison largest, and this building being Con Edison, one of Con Edison's largest customers. We hope the council recognizes this and look forward to continuing our discussion about the benefit of our steam system. We certainly understand the urgency in reaching society's carbon reduction goals, and it's important to engineer a smooth transition that is affordable to our customers. Con Edison has an obligation to provide New Yorkers with energy they need today to keep their homes and businesses energized. We look forward to working with you and other policymakers to ensure a smooth transition to our clean energy future. This is something, this is not something any one of us can accomplish alone. We are all in this together. Thank you once again for the opportunity to join you here this morning. We'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. I thank you for your testimony. Um, so uh, dealing with the actual, so let's, there's probably two buckets, right? Let's talk about first the actual incident. Uh, what safeguards failed as part of this malfunction um, that this occurred? So what happened is um, we had this malfunction, what we call this monitoring device, and typically when you have a failure like this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. In a matter of milliseconds, it would be um, off the system. In this case, the relay systems that's associated with which is similar to your um, your breaker in your house, which sense there's a problem and trip the breaker. In this case, the relay um, systems malfunction, and that's why you saw that sustained arc. So the so the it was overwhelmed. The system was overwhelmed, right? Or it wasn't overwhelmed, but there the breaker wasn't working to sort of stop the arc flash. I mean, that, that's my understanding. Of no, the point. system wasn't overwhelmed. I say, as I said, typically this lasted about four minutes. Right. Typically, it would happen in milliseconds. Uh, because the relay missed operated, the, as we said, the sensing device that looked on it, and the communication device, that's why you saw four minutes uh, before it came off the system. And what was kind of the sense response once this happened? Once this response, um, we had um, employees in the station. Uh, we mobilized to the station. As we said, um, it was extinguished in four minutes. The fire department did not um, have to enter the, the substation. And then we put folks was in there. We did the cleanup, as we, we said, and then we proceeded to make repairs over the, on the, few, the days following. Were you aware of the concerns in the, in the outlying community? I know that Marine Terrace, there were reports of the foundations of the building shaking. There were residents concerned about air quality. I was getting questions on social media. Do I have to evacuate? 
Uh, is it safe for me to have my child? Is it safe to my grandmother? Do I have to pack them up and leave? Um, were you aware of all of those concerns in the community and what was Con Edison doing um, to get out into the neighborhood once you'd established that, you know, obviously that the fire department didn't have to come, that you had this under control? What were you doing um, outside of the plan to reach out to residents? Yes, we were aware that uh, uh, that the, the commotion in the in the in the community, um, folks were there. Uh, we had our um, corporate affairs folks reaching out to elected officials, following that, and reaching out to the community at large. Um, we, of course, interfaced with the fire department. How many department people? How many night. people were out there speaking to residents in the community? I don't know the exact number. As I said, my corporate affairs uh, folks were out in the community. I'll get that number for you and get back to you. So what would you have done differently? There's some inherent risk with running the system. As I said, we, in this case, we have a redundant system that we have placed in there from a different manufacturer to make sure to minimize this from happening again. But what, what would you do differently in the community outreach portion? Um, because there was some real deep concern, right? This, you know, Western Queens, we've lived with Con Edison for a long time. You know, we're your neighbors. That's correct. You know, across the street from your facilities are people's homes where their children play, where they are out and about living their lives. They felt unsafe right after this incident. There was reports of a burning smell in the air. There were concerns about air quality. You know, we were able to get information out for them, but that was an hour, two hours later. Um, you know, how do we get a better one sense of you know, how we can better respond in the neighborhood and do better outreach? And then secondly, how do we make sure something like this doesn't happen? So the customers are at the center of what we do. We are... We're not only community, customers, the, we're the, your neighbors, the, the, the right? It's not just about a financial the com component. The, the community <laughs> is an important part of what we do. We constantly uh, community, communicate with, our, with the community. Uh, as I said, our corporate affairs was out talking to elective officials and the community because we are con always concerned to be good corporate citizens and work within the community. I, I'll just add that um, there was a big social media component to it because that's a way to get word out fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the, the specific outreach. But if there are ways you think we should be reaching out or, or channels that we're not using to reach out to the neighbors, please let us know. Well, we, we were, you know, we were using social media and. But there were a lot of people like on the ground who lived across the street whose building shook, right? And, and who you know, weren't necessarily looking at their phones, but were you know, elderly neighbors, you know, folks who don't have smartphones, but were uh, in a position to not know what's happening in their, own, you know, in their own neighborhood and live next to Condison every day, right? There's already a concern about living next to a power distribution system. I know you guys, I don't want to use power provider because that's not what you do but a power distribution system, there's that concern and unease, and then for something like this to happen, and if you knew pretty close that this was not a major event, why weren't there more people communicating that in the neighborhood across the street, saying, hey, it's all right, the air quality is safe, you can go back in, you don't have to evacuate your child, you don't have to, you don't have to leave your home. You know, people were asking me that question for others, not just for themselves. We, we, we would be happy to work on a way to develop a specific communication channel for the people, for the people who live right next to the plant, to the Cause, center. Because this was, I know this was two days after Christmas, everyone was still, you know, celebrating with one another. That's where I was. I was celebrating with my family and, and you know, enjoying a nice night. And then all of a sudden, it's unsettling. It's unsettling. Certainly understand, Councilman. So I want to make sure that's communicated on the record, but let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, renewables and our future. Uh, you know, what conversations have you had uh, with the city about reliability and emissions and how Con Edison can help us move to a renewable future? So we um, speak to the city uh, just about every day. Uh, I would say there's a, a number of ways we can answer this. Uh, one is, I think the, the overarching idea is that we are very committed to a clean energy future, but and also want to make sure that there is a smooth transition mm -hmm. to an, a, a f clean energy future that people can afford. So one we're doing with the city right now is 
doing a study on what it actually would cost um, to move to a renewable energy future in terms of what people would pay, what it would require to actually re to do the things that need to be done to have a renewable energy future, which is not something that has been studied at all, and that's due in about a year and a half or uh, a year so and a half or so. About a year is and a half. That, 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 that the findings will come out in about a year and a half. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's is that about is that about a year. About a year. Um, we're going to work. We're in conjunction with National Grid and the city to get a study on cost. I think the second thing we're doing is we're doing a lot of things right now because there's a things on the things that we can control. So one is using our own facilities to install renewable assets. So the shared solar program, Astoria is one of the sites. The idea is we're using our facilities, we control that, we're installing solar panels, and we'll put bill credits out to people who are in, currently in our low income uh, customer group. The third thing is we're do, working with the city on batteries. Uh, batteries have been tricky. Um, but we are looking for both utility scale size batteries where we can install those on our own facilities, uh, as well as uh, looking at different battery systems that can be used in a more residential setting. Um, so we're doing that on the battery side as well. Now, what's been the impediments to implementing those ideas? Um, there have been concerns. We're working very closely with the mayor's office. There have been concerns and, and very valid concerns by FDNY in terms of understanding uh, if there, in the, in the rare case that there is a potential fire on a battery, um, how those uh, fires would be fought um, in a residential setting. Uh, two, working with the Department of Buildings uh, to help them understand the, the building implications uh, and the building safety implications of having residential battery storage. And, how, and those conversations are going well. Do we see implementation soon? What's the We are working very closely timeline? with the mayor's office to move those agencies and address their concerns. Yeah. Okay, but there's no but time. There's no timeline that to work this through and to kind of implement. I, I don't currently know of a timeline other than we're trying to work as fast as possible. We'd ha we'd love to have your support in the, moving those conversations forward. So what what currently uh, percentage of your grid is renewable? It's about thirty percent. Yeah, I was going to say it's about, about thirty percent. Thirty percent. Yeah. About so so thirty is that for New York City or that's total nationwide? That's for New York City. For New York City. So, Jay, yeah, in our service and, territory. And you're the second largest solar producer in, the United, in America, right? Two separate things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but the, so there's the grid um, that we distribute power to New York City in uh, Westchester, Orange, and Rockland, and the five boroughs. And that anything that's renewable has to come from other sources because we're not al currently allowed to generate power in New York State. We are the second largest renewable energy developer in North America. Uh, with assets mostly in the West, um, because we are able to do that um, through one of our subsidiaries. But we're not currently allowed to be that developer in New York State. And you're asking the state to do that? We are asking, asking the state, state to do that. To do that. Yeah. Uh, now, on the shared solar, what is the timeline for implementation there? So we are working, go ahead. Yeah, we can say. Uh, yeah, we're thinking. Uh, of course, as we said, the largest um, building is in Astoria. You can get two megawatts of um, solar on the building. We're looking to do it in 2020. 2020. So next year. End of 2019, first quarter 2020. And when do you believe it'll be up and running? That that around that time. Yeah, it'll be up and running. It's not just starting constructions. Yeah. You're saying it'll be implemented by 2020. Yeah. And that residents in either public housing or, or Section 8 housing will be seeing a bill credit? It's more that it's not so much about the housing. It's more about if you are currently a member of our low income program. Okay. So, you could, so it doesn't really matter where you're, where you're living. Uh, we think it will provide monthly credits for approximately 900 low income customers. And as you said, the installation will be completed by the end of 2019, in the first quarter of 2020. Now, I was listening to your podcast. Uh, from January 4th that talked about the uh, 12 megawatt um, battery uh, storage facility in, in Queens. Tell me about how that's going. Yeah, and it, was, it was January 4th, I think it was Mark uh, Kitsky, he talked about energy trends for 2019, how you know, yellow should be like the, the color. I, I, so we have some customer side solution that we have done in Brooklyn, Queens totally 20, 34 megawatts. Uh, we have utility side solution. We have two megawatts of battery on our side. And then we see uh, base looking out, we're gonna put uh, roughly over 30 megawatts of batteries in our substation sited. We're looking to- But you have 12 megawatts now, right? 
Just about. Just, just about. Just about. And, and it's going well. It's, it's, it's working out as, as, as anticipated. You're looking to expand to 30. Yeah, just, just as um, Kyle said, it's working well. Some of the concerns, of course, working with it, FDNY, to make sure in terms of fire, mm. how would it, as well as DOB in a residential neighborhood. I mean, it's, it, there are the classic issues of people are concerned about having these, these assets in their neighborhoods, similar to what you said about uh, living near, uh, near, near Astoria and the concerns there. And so the idea is we're working a lot with the communities to make them understand that these are safe and that they actually benefit the resiliency uh, of the neighborhood, um, but that they're also part of our, our clean energy future. We're also looking to do one, uh, several in, in Brooklyn as well. So how do you partner with customers to make you know, good choices? Right, like you know, I, I'll make it akin to, you know, that I can go to my refrigerator, I can take out a bag of potato chips and, you know, a, a brownie and eat all sorts of bad food, or I can, you know, take out some carrots and like eat healthy food, right? So how do we, how do we help our customers make good, healthy choices? Uh, are there incentives? Are there conversations that are had to say, you know, don't go with fossil fuels? Uh, if there are opportunities for you to use renewable energy, we want to help you do that. How do those conversations work? So, so you see we have a pretty aggressive energy efficiency program. Uh, if you look in Brooklyn and Queens, we have um, replaced um, lighting. Of course, we have an, uh, also an aggressive um, smart meter program where the uh, customer can control exactly how they use electricity. We have um, visibility to see how they do that. And we constantly, if you look on our website, if you look on the communication we have the, with the customer, energy efficiency is a part of that discussion, as well as how to use um, energy efficiently. As a matter of fact, we have bill inserts that tell you how much um, electricity you use compared to your neighbors. And this communication constantly happening with our co customers. And the other thing I would say is uh, we have a program for installing smart meters throughout the city. Um, that will also give us and customers uh, much more transparency into, one, how they're using, when they're using uh, their power, and in different ways they can use less power. I would say, though, to your question, our conversations with customers are about using less energy. We don't necessarily talk to our customers about, on the electricity side, about using fossil fuels. Those, those are conversations that, that ESCOs, uh, energy service companies, tend to have with uh, their customers as well. But, but we do we offer about, incentives to use gas or fossil fuels over renewables? Like, is, is Con Edison currently marketing gas to customers over, fossil, over renewables? The only marketing that would be taking place, so on the electricity side, no, um, but on the on the, there have been some programs in the past to expand away from fuel oil to mm -hmm. natural gas, uh, which is something that's ending, uh, I think, at the end of this year. Right. So that's, that is one place where there have been incentives until recently to switch to natural gas, but that's from switching from oil to gas. So there's no incentives that would be made to go from, uh, from you know, fuel oil to Renew, you know, to natural gas in, in lieu of renewables, right? If someone said, I want to do renewables, you're not saying, but do you, there's $2 million on the table that you can take for natural gas, right? We're not, we're not having those types of conversations, right? So there have been discussion with the customers, as I said, if you look on our Brooklyn Queens demand management, where we went into the neighborhoods talking to customers, how can we put um, new technology in there? in that um, area to push off the installation of a substation. So I would say those discussions are happening with the customers and we're giving them in some incentives to make that transition from um, off fossil fuel, as you say, to, to new energy. It's, it's like, you know, there's two, I keep saying buckets, but there really are two, two conversations that have to be had here, right? There's one about efficiency and about smart metering, and then there's, you know, there's the not using it at all, right? It's, 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 how do we make that step to making choices that are renewable and not sort of hanging a carrot out there and saying, you know, don't do this, because you can, you can get a million dollars for doing natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel and still a challenge, and we need to be moving away from natural gas, uh, not steering people towards that, right? So I just want to make sure that Con Edison's having those, both of those conversations, right? Yes, we are. 
And so let's talk a little bit about natural gas and, and, and the, the rate case and rate hikes. Um, you know, on, on January 31st, Conniston proposed new rate increases for electric, you know, 485 million, and gas, uh, $210 million for delivery systems in 2020 to fund infrastructure investments. Uh, what infrastructure uh, investments would be proposed under this rate hike? Um, so the rate review is a year-long public um, review process where stakeholders get involved. Uh, our proposal, as you said, make major in, um, investment to enhance the reliability um, of our system. Many of our investment that we're talking about will encourage the development of new technology, green energy, the very things that we're discussing here today. For example, as we said, looking to put batteries in our substation, <coughs> um, doing um, projects, uh, soliciting projects that will help transition us from fossil fuels to, to green energy. Um, looking on to new technology, if you look on the electric transmission system, our environmental, we get off the old oil cables and get into new technology with solid dielectric. So it's one to enhance the reliability of our system and serve our customer and prepare the grid for this new technology and moving power back between the customers and the grid. So the, so the, the, the crux of this rate hike is focused around preparing our entire grid system for a renewable future. What percentage of the proposed increase would go to fund renewable energy infrastructure? So I would say it's safety, reliability, and enhancing um, the grid to prepare for new technologies. But there's no percentage that to, to get us that's uh, talking we can, about? There's, we can there's, get there's some percent. programs in the uh, electric rate case, and uh, we can get you that, that number, but there is a portion. I would also say that a big portion of the both on the electric side, I, and I don't know the exact percentage, just answering a question mm -hmm. before okay, I ask no, it. I, I'll, I'll take whatever you can give me. Is um, a big portion of our natural gas and electric rate case is uh, increased property taxes by the city. Increased property taxes. Okay. Uh, what about gas, uh, methane gas emissions from leaks? That's, that's um, as you know, we're replacing nine miles of leak prone pipes per year. That will, of course, um, minimize the amount of leaks that we're seeing in our system, and that's targeted as part of the gas rate case. And we're also doing methane detectors, in-home methane detectors that communicate with our smart meters so that uh, we are able to uh, um, detect methane leaks. In, in, the, in the past, it's been about someone's, essentially the best detector has been someone's nose. Mm -hmm. um, these methane detectors work close with our smart meters so that uh, detection can happen even if there's no one present. So and that's new technology that we at Con Edison develop. I think it's the first in the world, okay. these new methane detectors. Now, how much, how much methane gas is emitted in New York City from gas leaking mains every year? I don't know. We'll get back to you yeah. with that number. Okay, can you get back to me? Yeah. Not just a phone call, but like in a letter. I'm sure, we'll send yeah. you a letter. <laughs> <laughs> to this committee, thank you. Um, you know, what, what percentage increase uh, would New York City customers see from this rate case? So the monthly electric bill for New, New York City residential customers using 300 megawatts, uh, you would see an increase of $4.45. Uh, that's an increase of roughly 5.8%. Okay. And this is currently before the PSC and taking public comment? Uh, yes, as I said, it's a, uh, roughly a one-year uh, process where you really engage the stakeholders. Um, on this issue. Uh, the last bit of questions that I have really go around your actual power plants. I know you do have a steam plant you know, in Manhattan. Uh, what, what sources of energy do you use there to generate the steam? So we use natural gas to, to uh, and as we said, it's a co-generation. That means you produce very efficient, 60% efficiency that you use both, producing both electric and steam. And what are your plans to change that plan over time? Uh, so so how, how do we, you know, how do we, as if New York State allows you to be, um, to, st to allow solar, do you have any plans of turning that plan over to the renewables? 
So, so we agree it's a, it's a transition process. Steam, as you know, is very efficient. As I said in the testimony, it gets boilers out of the home. It's a centralized system. You get leads certified uh, associated with it. Uh, just like anything else, it's a transition process. And if the technology is there that you can transition off steam, even though it's very well, no, efficient. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the customers. I'm talking about you know the way you produce the power, right? Like you're. Here, you're not only the distributor, but you are the creator, right? You're, you're the actual power plant in, the, in this instance. Mm -hmm. So how are you looking to take that plant to make that plant producing uh, clean, you know, that plant produced, you know, start from, you're right now using natural gas to create the steam. That, that's correct. So what are you doing to make that a re more renewable-based system to create that steam and electricity? So right now the technology is that we, we use natural gas um, to produce the steam. And as I said, as we transition on new technologies that can replace steam, we'll certainly look to do that in, in the future. Right, I, mean, right, I, I don't think, I think the, the, the technology doesn't I exist, right, exist right, right now to right create now. the amount of steam we need with electricity. So you see we made the transition from oil to gas. Um, the plants, as I said, are very efficient. Um, Cogeneration allow you to do to uh, um, produce both electric and steam, so very efficient, 60% efficiency. I'm sure as the technology develops that we can transition off, we certainly look to do so. But right now, that's the technology that's there. Because you know, my big concern about power plants is they're stationary sources of pollution. Um, you know, they don't get up and stretch their legs. They're in communities, they're in neighborhoods, there are emissions that are associated from those plants. Uh, and I can't talk to you about that in, in many instances because you're, uh, I, I'm hoping that some of them are here today, some of the power producers, I'm not sure that they, they're here yet. Well, energy is here. Oh, energy is here. Okay, so there's, there's a couple of them here. Um, I'm looking forward from hearing from them, but they're stationary sources of pollution. Um, and I want to make sure that we are uh, moving to a greener, renewable future, right? That's what 1318 all is about, is replacing in-city gas-powered power plants and replacing them with renewable energy. That's the goal. And as we say, we, we certainly support that. We want to move to the new technology. We certainly want to make sure that it's well thought out and, uh, and of course, the cost to the customer. Great. So you're going to work with us. You're in support of the legislation. You're going to work with the city to help us draw up that map, correct? That's correct. All right. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I see we have uh, been joined by Council Member Donovan Richards, uh, also from Queens. Thank you for being here today. Uh, Carlos Donovan, you guys have any questions for Con Edison? No? Donovan? I guess not. Okay. Just yeah. one question, I guess. Um, how do you, do you work with NYSERDA? So uh, obviously I think you're offering some programming. I don't know if this was touched on um, for homeowners to transition as well. So can you tell me about uh, your work in relationship with NYSERDA and how do you coordinate uh, with local homeowners or local building owners on transitioning uh, to renewable energy. Good morning, Council Member. Um, so we work a lot. We work very closely with NYSERDA and help them design their programs. At the end of the day, their programs are uh, a function of their board, legislation, um, and in uh, Albany. But we do work very closely with them to develop um, the right types of programs to address where we're going. Uh, and then we help market those uh, uh, potentially to our to our customers. And then at a hearing a few weeks ago uh, that the chair held, um, there was conversation around this fund. Is that, that I think it's in your office? It's fifteen million dollars to help transition um, building owners and others to uh, solar and other things. So I'm interested in hearing how what is the coordination like between Con Edison. Um, other utility companies with the city on pushing these programs that it seemed to me, I think at that time, Costa, there were 32 programs, 32 grants or programs given out from 2011 to now. Um, so what does that coordination look like between uh, Con Edison and the mayor's office or DEP? Uh, in terms of that specific programming as well. We work very, very closely uh, with the mayor's office on this and a, a number of programs. We also work very closely 
um, in the communities are themselves. So I have about 45 people or so in my regional community affairs uh, in all five boroughs and throughout the service territory that are constantly working with uh, community partners to identify the right um, type of um, program, uh, the right type of recipients for the programs that are in place, whether or not they are NYSERDA programs, Con Edison programs, et cetera. So there are pretty robust conversations at the community level, which we find to be the most effective. And I know that this specific area, uh, I think I saw the chair on New York One this morning, um, pointing out that this is a high asthma area. Um, so what do you specifically, what I'm trying to get at is how, how are, is there a laser focus on EJ communities like this? Um, you know, are you, are you looking and strategically working with building owners and homeowners in, specific, in the specific areas around Astoria um, to help reduce carbon emissions, but secondly, to address the EJ issues in that community? So what does that look like? So one of the things we're doing, we talked about um, earlier, is uh, in Astoria, for example, we are working on uh, installing, uh, the council member asked, what are we doing sort of right now to help with the transition to a renewable future? Uh, so Astoria, where we have a huge footprint uh, that we share with um, our, the, private develop, the private generators, uh, we are installing solar uh, assets on that facility, on the, that's land we control and own, and we can install that uh, and Con Edison is essentially installing solar panels in Astoria, and it was approved by, we filed with the Public Service Commission, and was it was approved a program where the solar that we generate, the solar energy that we generate, and we're able to put back into the system, the value of that is transferred to low-income customers on their bills. So if you are currently a low-income customer, at the end of 2019, uh, early 2020 when this is finished and in, in an operation, you will essentially be participating as if you had a solar panel on the roof of your building, but it's just at uh, the Astoria Yards. And I know there are there's public housing over there. Astoria, I think the Astoria Houses is over there. That's right. Tell me about your coordination with NYCHA. Okay. Um, have you looked at using renewables specifically in that development over there? And I'm assuming if the asthma rates are high in that area for residents in public housing, it's, it's probably double the rate. So just speak to what does that look like, the coordination with NYCHA on the possibility of uh, renewable energy? Yeah, so we have worked uh, very closely with NYCHA, uh, Bomi Jung from NYCHA in particular, who's been uh, very dogged about, and right now we're in the phase of looking at uh, we would like to do a similar program uh, that we were talking about with, with Astoria. We just don't necessarily obviously control the, the real estate uh, in the same way with NYCHA that we do and Astoria. So there's an active conversation now about installing uh, renewable assets, or solar assets specifically on, on NYCHA developments, and that's something that's happening. In Astoria houses. Uh, throughout the entire. Uh, throughout the entire area. If you look in the Brooklyn, Queens area, as we said in, in our demand response, we have been done. E energy efficiency, fuel cells, batteries, working with Marcus Garvey houses, for example, to put in fuel cells. So there's constant discussion with the community, with NYCHA, with uh, NYSERDA. Uh, we have energy efficiency programs that we have, NYCHA, um, NYSERDA has energy efficiency programs. So we, you constantly have a discussion between us, the community, and um, NYCHA, for example, and NYSERDA. I look forward to hearing more concrete plans on that uh, eventually. And I just want to ask the one last question um, or two. Um, uh, how many, did your plan have any violations prior to uh, this incident? R repeat the question. Any violations issued to this specific plant before uh, the blast? Yeah, no, no violations on the substations. Okay, and the state would obviously regulate and check that, right? That's correct, as well as the city as well. All righty, thank you, Mr. Chair. The only piece we're missing is the NYPD. I wanted to know if they would be prepared in the case of any extraterrestrial activity happening in our city, <laughs> but since I don't see them here, uh, yeah, I wish they were here to, to answer that question. I'm really concerned about the state of our city uh, when it comes to aliens uh, invading us. So, 
hope so, so see them at the next hearing. I won't comment on the aliens, but we certainly, if you looked on the event that night, NYPD was there, FDNY. We collaborate with them um, at, at every level, both the FDNY and the NYPD. So when there's something happen, there's communications uh, between Con Ed and these Well, entities. as a Queens resident and the chair of the Public Safety Committee, I just want the NYPD to know I'm concerned about their preparation uh, in an alien uh, invasion. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for a great hearing. Now, if you're up for a joint hearing, you know, we can do it together. I am ready to do it tomorrow if you wish. Uh, uh, Councilmember Menchaca has some questions as well. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for coming to testify. You know, the work, <clears throat> the work that the, the Chair is doing in Astoria with all of you is, is a good reminder for us to look at other parts of the city. I'm thinking about a place that I know well, Red Hook, and the relationship that you have with that community, really specifically around the investment that's going into the Red Hook NYCHA houses, east and west. And so can you talk a little bit about that in relationship to the issues that we're seeing in Astoria and how Con Ed and the real responsibility that you are having as you connect to both the NYCHA campus, the non-NYCHA campus, a waterfront community uh, where we have been grappling with resiliency, talking about off-grid, talking about renewable um, energy, electricity plans, and just give us a quick update on, on that if you have that information. You want to do it? Um, I don't have a number. I haven't gotten a most recent update on what's going on in Red Hook. I would say that uh, s stepping back from that, and I'm happy to, to get back to you with more details on that. Um, I think that the resiliency piece is a, is a huge component th of the renewable conversation, which is why we are very strong, strong, strong believers in, um, in both solar generation sort of on-site as, as close as possible, which is sort of why you need substations like this. Even if you have a 100% renewable grid, um, you have to have the assets around the city. So the conversation, I think you're right, it has to be a robust conversation about resiliency, about renewables, uh, and making sure that people have access, um, that it's not just the province of people who can afford um, these capital projects, but that it's something that's available to all. And I think Red Hook's a good example of it, of what we're doing there, but I don't have the specifics of where that program stands right now. Great. And I would well, say, ju just like you see after Hurricane Sandy, we have engaged NYCHA on many fronts following being on the waterfront, resiliency, and what we need to do if we should have a similar event. So that discussion continues at every level of the company and, and as well as the, the NYCHA agency. Well, looking forward to, to talking with you, uh, maybe at another hearing, but also in the community. And I welcome that conversation to happen uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Chuck. I, I have two last questions. Um, one about uh, one of my colleagues uh, who is not a member of this committee and couldn't be here today, but they had a question relating to power outages in Jamaica caused by balloons that left about 1,500 residents uh, in the dark back in December. Uh, you know, when you talk about power and, and your distribution, uh, you know, how many outages have been caused over the last two years but incidental contact with overhead power lines in Southeast Queens? So we don't have that information at hand, but of course it's a overhead system, so you will have uh, incidental contact at, at some point. Uh, we'll research that information and get back to you. I would and say we also, we do have, um, I would say in, we can get back to you then when the number of specific outages, but mylar balloons uh, it does tend to be a problem for the overhead system, um, specifically in Coney Island, for obvious reasons uh, in that area. But that is something, uh, I would say squirrels and mylar balloons are um, some of our biggest adversaries. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that one right there. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one right there and just know that I, mean, I, I, you know, I, I share my colleagues' concern, Donovan Richards. I share uh, my other colleagues' uh, concerns. I mean, you know, raccoons as well. I mean, we, you know, uh, yeah, there's some, yeah, I'm not going to touch that one. Um, but that said, um, another issue, when we talk about the solar installation and, and all the work that Coniston does, um, how are we, what workforce are we doing that with when it comes to PLAs and 
Um, you know, are, are we doing it union? Are we doing it non-union? Like, are, you know, this is New York City is a union town. Like, how are we um, doing this work to make sure that we're creating good jobs as well? So our union, uh, our workforce is a union workforce at Con Ed. So they're doing these installations. You know, all this is being implemented with union labor. So we do put RFPs out to solicit to do demonstration projects, uh, and I think both those are a mixture of union and non-union. And I think the, the, the more that we can do, um, you know, this is about not only social, you know, environmental justice, but also uh, you know, making sure that we're creating jobs for the 21st century, um, and that those jobs you know, should be with the benefits they need. And the legislation we've designed for the, uh, the ability for us to have renewable, renewable assets uh, on a utility scale, because I think whether or not you want it to be in 50 years, or in, in 30 years, 20 years, or 10 years, this transition to renewable energy, it has five, to- but or Five, but- <laughs> um, Sooner. It has, to, it has to be, we have to have all the tools in the toolkit to get the renewable assets built and the transmission lines uh, to get the power to where it needs to go. And so we feel like with the utility scale solar, um, the ability to do that, one of the things we've, uh, we've promised is that all of those projects would be, dealt, would be built with union labor which is not necessarily the case as it stands now. So it will be the case moving forward. I'm glad to hear that. Um, any other questions from my colleagues? All right, I appreciate you coming here to testify today. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. looking forward to working with you. Thanks. Okay. We'll get back to you on those specific things. Thank you. I look forward to it. All right, so next up we have uh, Suzanne DeRoche, uh, Deputy Director, Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I see you guys are up second this time. Usually you're, you're, you're hitting lead off. And since you are of a mayoral agency, I need to have Samara swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? <clears throat> Do you swear a friend to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were making a statement as well. No, no, no. I, I do it once. Great. <laughs> well, having I know, not like gone our, second, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's we're a whole new routine. <laughs> we got to get into. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Suzanne DeRoche, and I am the Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy at both the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined here today by Ka Wei, Assistant Director for Infrastructure, also with MOR and MOS. I want to thank Chairperson Constantinides and the members of the Committee for Environmental Protection for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration on Introduction 1318. Our electric grid is one of the most critical lifeline systems in our city. It serves over 8 million people and 250,000 businesses. It supports our lives and livelihoods, including economic and governance activities of global importance. When it fails, the cascading impacts affect critical services from transportation to telecommunications, as well as our economy and our access to healthcare. The grid, however, needs to be cleaner. New York State's existing transmission system does not enable enough renewable energy produced in the northern and western portions of the state to flow to the city. To clean up our grid, the city must reduce its reliance on old, inefficient, fossil fuel-based power plants located in New York City while simultaneously increasing electricity transmission, allowing us to bring more renewable energy into the five boroughs. Our electric distribution system is controlled by two primary entities. One, Con Edison, which serves nearly the entire city, with the exception of the Rockaway Peninsula, and two, Long Island Power Authority, or LIPA, which serves the Rockaway Peninsula through an operating agreement with PSE&G. Con Edison is regulated by the state's Public Service Commission, the PSC. Roughly half of the city's annual electricity consumption comes from 21 in-city power plants, which have a combined capacity of over 9,000 megawatts. Because of the lack of transmission capacity to access power generated in other parts of the state, the New York State Reliability Council mandates that about 80% of the city's peak electricity demand must be located within city limits to ensure that the lights stay on. 
All of the electric generating units in New York City rely on natural gas as their primary fuel and fuel oil as backup. Being able to burn two types of fuel in, one, in case one is not available is also a reliability requirement. While maintaining reliability is always a priority, the city deserves an electric system that is clean and efficient. A majority of the city's power plants are old, inefficient, and dirty. By 2021, when Indian Point Energy Center retires, over 70% of the plants in New York City will be over 50 years old, exacerbating their contribution to air pollution. The city's 80 by 50 roadmap lays out several steps to transitioning our electricity from fossil fuels to a clean energy future. Important elements of that transition are a significant increase in one, local and large scale renewable power, two, new transmission that connects New York City to renewable power generated elsewhere, and three, energy storage to balance the intermittency of wind and solar. The administration strongly supports transitioning the in-city power plants to cleaner sources of electricity. In fact, the city and state's climate goals and our energy future depends on it. Due to new emission, emissions rules we expect from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation later this year, we anticipate that New York City's oldest peaker plants will retire and be replaced in part by energy storage. To encourage the pro proliferation of storage across the state, the PSC recently set a statewide energy storage goal of 3,000 megawatts by 2030. Within the city, PSC is requiring Con Edison to procure 300 megawatts of energy storage by the end of 2022. This is a great short-term goal and will, allow will lay the foundation for broader storage deployment across the city. However, bringing large-scale renewable power directly in the city is more challenging and will require a long-term strategy and substantial investments in transmission and renewable generation. For these reasons, the administration supports the renewable, power, renewable energy and battery storage feasibility study as envisioned in intro 1318. We suggest, however, that this study be carried out as a component of the long-term energy plan required by Local Law 248 of 2017. By doing so, the city will be able to comprehensively assess measures to achieve deep decarbonization. The administration's climate agenda includes the goal to secure as much clean energy as possible for the city. While our solar goals are aggressive, solar in the city alone will not provide enough renewable power to meet the city's electricity needs. To meet our 80 by 50 goal, including efforts to electrify our buildings and transportation, it is clear that New York City will require significant amounts of renewable energy flowing from upstate to downstate, as well as a substantial portion of the state's recently announced 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind directly connecting into the city. The reason that increasing the city's access to upstate renewables is so important is underscored by the following facts. Today, in upstate New York, about 70% of the electricity generated is already carbon free. In downstate, with Indian Point currently operating, about 30% of the electricity is carbon free. However, without more transmission, the, the energy generated by upstate renewables cannot flow into New York City. New York City accounts for over 30% of the state's electricity consumption and 40% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. To meet the state's 100% clean energy, clean electricity goal by 2040 and dramatically reduce our reliance on polluting in-city power plants, the state must invest in both tra new transmission for upstate to downstate and offshore wind. I thank you for the opportunity to testify. We share your goals to protect, improve, and de decarbonize, decarbonize New York City's electricity supply. We're happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. All right, great, thank you. That, that was pretty great, uh, pretty quick. All right, so um, I don't want to play he said, she said with you, but I know Con Edison kind of put uh, uh, the crux of their rate hikes on the administration's shoulders. Uh, what is your response to that? So we are taking a very careful look at the filing that was you know, issued um, on the 31st. Um, the city has traditionally been uh, a very active participant in the rate cases, and we anticipate doing that again this year. We'll be um, looking at all of the details of the capital expenditures uh, against our 80 by 50 goals, um, including our renewable energy goals, and um, ensuring that the monies that are spent, we feel are aligned with um, the city's goals and what's best for the residents. All right, and then also, 
you know, thinking about utility battery storage and how we can make it easier uh, for entities to implement those. Uh, how are those conversations going on the city's end? What, we can, what can we do? Uh, you know, I'm not here advocating for us to be less safe, right? I'm not here sure. to say we should bypass um, any safety concerns that anyone has, but how do we sort of cut through the red tape to have them have entities install utility battery storage on a quicker pace? Yeah, so we're really excited about the state's recent um, uh, announcements around storage. Um, we see this as a great opportunity to replace uh, the peakers that we expect to go offline, at least in part. Um, so we understand that the permitting process um, can be lengthy, and we've been working quite hard with um, all the stakeholders and city agencies. Uh, we've convened, CUNY has convened a working group and we've issued one set of guidelines for outdoor installation of lithium ion. And we've kicked off a second working group to do indoor installations. Uh, that just recently kicked off. That will, effort will be happening this year. Um, so, you know, again, we are also trying to balance the safety concerns of first responders with, right. you know, the proliferation of storage throughout the city. And what is, um, as we're looking to implement these battery storage technologies uh, to replace power plants, like what are our thoughts in, in supporting environmental justice communities? As, as my colleague talked about, uh, you know, what we talked about earlier, um, you know, many of these plants, especially from the Power Now plants in, in 2001, you know, we're on year 18 of what's supposed to be year three. Mm. Um, how, do, how do we work to see those plants close down and, and uh, work with those communities? So again, we are very concerned about the environmental justice issues. We've been quite strongly advocating for um, an environmental justice adder at the state level within their VEDER proceedings, um, working together quite closely with NYU on a methodology for actually you know, incentivizing and giving benefits to um, renewable power, renewable installations for their EJ contributions, you know, for uh, as well as air quality um, improvements. In terms of how do we look at uh, storage and the, the 21 plants, we have to balance across, and, and Con Edison will be releasing a study over the summer, so now I'm gonna do a he said, she said back to Con Edison, um, where they show where that 300 megawatts will, uh, will best suit the system, right? So um, we have to balance the needs of the local distribution network with where these installations make the most sense. And we're going to be advocating, I mean, the ISO now says we have to, you know, have this certain number of production was 80 percent in the city limits. You know, in the long term, we need to advocate for them to take away that rule, right? Because we need to be able to pull renewable energy from other parts of the state. So the New York State Reliability Council is the entity that sets that uh, rough, it's roughly 80% um, this year. I think it's a little bit higher. And they do that through some pretty extensive study. That's a, it's a state entity. Um, so again, their goal is for reliability of the system, right? That's how they set that, that number. Um, so again, they, they do that on a yearly basis. All right, but every, every time a peaker plant goes on, um, those, that's probably the most inefficient way uh, for us to power a city in the, tw in the, in the, in the 21st century, right? Like they, these are stationary sources of, uh, uh, sources of pollution, uh, mostly in environmental justice communities where those pollution, you know, you're more likely to have respiratory illness than not and be higher than the city average if you're living next to these plants. So again, we're, we're also quite concerned about the air quality issues related to all, all of the plants. Uh, the dirtiest, most inefficient ones, um, you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, some of which will be over 50 years old. 70% of the cities will be over 50 years old. So again, you know, at, one of our main concerns here is that we should be studying the role of transmission in order to uh, reduce our reliance on in-city generation. And I think that that's something that, you know, we should all be pushing the state to um, consider a priority. Because I mean, as we talked about before, I mean, I have, I've talked about this many times, but, you know, Ravenswood generating, Astoria generating, our NRG, all of these plants in Western Queens are in close proximity to the Queensbridge houses, the Ravenswood houses, the Astoria houses, and uh, Woodside houses a stone's throw away. Uh, so you're talking about 
a, a rather large grouping of public housing, all surrounded by these power plants, all uh, you know, in, a, in zones that have asthma rates that are higher than the borough average, ER, admission, er, ER admissions and hospitalizations are higher. Um, so there, there's a correlation there, right? I mean, there's a lot of things going on in Western Queens beyond just these plants, mm -hmm. but these are a temporary sources of pollution that we significantly deal with every day. And we share your concern. Uh, I mean, what conversations are we talking about having about reliability? Um, and thinking about you know, what a 21st century grid looks like and how do we get there? So again, we're really excited about the, um, both doing the long-term energy plan and folding in this, this new bill around storage, what the role storage can play. Um, again, we're gonna need all the tools that we have. We're gonna need large-scale renewables coming in from transmission, we're gonna need offshore wind, we need to maximize uh, distributed generation within city limits in order to really have the 70 to 80% renewable grid that we envision. And we talked about implementation of large-scale renewables you know, in New York City. Uh, you know, as you know, I was working with, uh, with CUNY, um, you know, CUNY Law, we have a great professor here, Rebecca Bratsby's and, and Cure at CUNY Law School, and we have a report that if we utilized just a fourth of the land on Rikers Island, we could have enough power generated from solar that could replace many of those plants that were put in by the power now, uh, you know, foisted upon these neighborhoods for years. What are your thoughts on that? So look forward to seeing that report. I don't know if that's been, been made public, but uh, uh, look forward to seeing that. So, you know, again, I, I think it's- but They're gonna be publishing it soon. So, right. but, but it's something right. that I've talked about. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that we need to think about opportunities and, and with Rikers Line, Island being uh, closing, uh, rightfully so as a social justice. Uh, it's been tearing apart communities, but these plants have been in those same neighborhoods. Um, we should be looking as an opportunity, as for it to be an opportunity, right? So we're gonna look at all available space in the city, right? The reason that we have um, challenges citing large-scale renewables is that we have a lack of space, and the space tends to be quite valuable um, within New York City. So as we move forward with the long-term energy plan, we're gonna be looking at all available uh, feasible locations. Well, I'm gonna be fighting hard to make sure we utilize that land to the benefit of everyone. So um, any questions my colleagues have? All right, great. Uh, and you know, I'm looking forward to, so I'm gonna take yes for an answer, all right? So you're, you're coming here in support of 1318 today and we're looking forward to working with you to implement not just this, but all of the renewable projects and I appreciate your partnership. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next up. All right, so the, the aforementioned uh, Rebecca Bratsby is from CUNY Law School. Uh, Brian McCabe from NRG Energy, and Don, um, oh, I, 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 Shabasto, National, with a name like Constantinidis, like I always try to like not butcher anyone's names because I live that every single day of my life. <laughs> Professor Bradsby, I think I'm gonna start with you. Let's hear some good news first. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I have to say is entirely good news. Uh -huh. um, my name is Rebecca Bradsby. I'm a professor at CUNY School of Law, where I run the Center for Urban Environmental Reform. And I'm joined today here by my colleague, Professor Sarah Lambden. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna share is work that we've done jointly. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present my views about both the events of December 27th in Astoria and about Introductory Bill 1318. Um, so when the skies in New York City turned blue, it was eerie, it was confusing, and for many residents who vividly remember 9-11, it was beyond frightening. I live roughly a mile from the affected facility. Along with thousands of my neighbors, I watched the sky glow and saw the smoke billow. 
I joined those neighbors on social media asking, does anyone know what's going on? Many reported that the most terrifying part was not knowing what was happening or what to do. I'm an expert on environmental policy, and even I couldn't answer a basic question. If there's a disaster at a power plant in Astoria, should we evacuate or shelter in place? Astoria is home to roughly 60% of New York City's generating capacity. The power plants are located in this small, densely populated Queens neighborhood. EPA estimates uh, say, suggest that a disaster at one of those plants could impact up to a million people. Astorians are not prepared for such a disaster, neither is the city. Decades ago, Congress enacted the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, EPCRA, to give citizens a right to access information about possible hazards in their community and to plan for how to respond should an emergency occur. EPCRA embraces the proposition that the more we know about the hazards in our community, the better equipped we are to protect ourselves from unacceptable risk. EPCRA requires localized emergency planning. Each community must have a local emergency planning committee. Each such committee must have public members, public meetings, and its plans must be public. New York State directs that LEPC plans be available at public libraries. My colleague Sarah Lambden and I discovered that New York City is failing to meet these obligations. It is next to impossible to find the information that EPCRA requires be made public, and even the most basic information about the city's LEPC is hard to find. New York obviously has emergency planning. That's the EP part of EPCRA. But federal law also requires the CRA part of EPCRA, the community's right to know. The generalized emergency planning and preparedness education from New York's Office of Emergency Management falls far short of what federal law requires. A community like Astoria has no way to, localized, to access localized information about the specific hazards it faces or what the plan should be if the sky turns blue. The city is not providing the community-focused transparency that federal law mandates. This leaves communities like Astoria at risk and in ignorance, exactly the situation EPCRA was enacted to prevent. Professor Lambden and I urge the City Council to investigate and to ensure that the city fully complies with its EPCRA obligations. I also want to speak to the importance of um, 1318 which will require the city to study the feasibility of in replacing uh, in-city gas-fired power plants. I wholeheartedly support this plan, and in particular, I'd like to share a little bit of my research, it's ongoing research, just to be clear, it's still in progress, about how Rikers Island could be repurposed for solar generation and storage, making it possible to remove gas-fired power plants that were forced on the city two decades ago. You may remember that in 2000, California was having rolling blackouts. The New York Power Authority used California's situation as a pretext to build 11 new fired gas power, uh, new gas fired power plants in the city on an emergency basis. All of them were placed in environmental justice communities, poor communities and communities of color. These plants were cited with virtually no process and over vehement community objections. NYPA promised the power plants were a temporary emergency measure and would be removed after three years. No, nearly 20 years later, the power plants are still there. At the time, NYPA claimed these power plants were necessary to keep the lights on. Yet the Public Service Commission found the city could have met its peak power needs without these plants. Indeed, the New York State Controller expressed concern that the plan risked generating more power than the city required. Although NYPA claimed the turbines would be in industrial areas, they were all placed in communities. One was sited a block away from Queensbridge houses, the largest public housing complex in the United States. One in Brooklyn was next to a playground and around the corner from a school. A third in Staten Island was across the street from homes. Four were placed in the part of the South Bronx known as Asthma Alley because it has some of the highest asthma rates in this country. All of these communities were already overburdened. This has to end. All of Rikers' 416 acres are within LaGuardia Airport's flight obstruction area. Height restrictions and noise limit the possible uses. 
If just 100 acres of Rikers were devoted to solar panels and energy storage, the island could generate enough electricity to replace these temporary power plants that were foisted on environmental justice com communities two decades ago. Moreover, these communities, the ones where the plants are located, are among those the Lippmann Report identified as the most affected by Rikers. This plan would offer restorative justice. It would remove the power plants placed in these communities without their input or consent and bring improved air quality to those most impacted by Rikers. Once shuttered, the plants could be decommissioned and the land converted to much needed green space. Thank you for your attention. I urge you to, to enact um, intro 1318 and to end the city's dependency on these dirty gas burning power plants. And before I go to the next panelist, I just want to uh, reiterate this. I know these weren't the right uh, folks here, but I share Councilmember Richard's concern on the public safety end. Uh, because this wasn't deemed by the Office of Emergency Management a life-threatening incident, uh, Notify NYC did not send out res uh, inc uh, results, did not send out information to the public. Uh, and that we found that to be woefully inadequate. Um, even though entities like Constant may have known after four minutes this wasn't life-threatening, we had no way of knowing that on the ground. And, New York, and, and Notify NYC should have been pumping this information out in a different way. We should have been getting those, those, those messages to our phones uh, because that part of this, as you stated, was uh, that not knowing. And that not knowing was, was excruciating um, for you know, whether, is it the air quality? Do we have to evacuate? So I will definitely follow up when we talk about evacuation plans and plans for safety. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Donald Shabazzpour. I'm the director of the Gas Utility Future at National Grid. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to present our perspective on how we transition to a low carbon green energy system. We at National Grid view climate change as the greatest challenge that humanity is facing. And at the same time, it is the greatest challenge that we are facing in the energy industry. We believe in the science of climate change, and we have a blueprint for drastically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We call that our North, uh, Northeast 8050 pathways. We fully support the 8050 targets of every state that we operate in, which is New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. At the federal level, we have supported uh, the Paris Agreement. We have publicly urged the administration to remain in the Paris Agreement. And our approach aligns with New York City, New York State, and the Northeast clean energy transition policies to help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We are a strong advocate for policy and regulatory approaches that provides reasonable methods to help achieve emission targets in a reliable and affordable way to achieve those emission reduction targets. For National Grid, climate change is not a political question but a scientific fact. And we believe that innovation and a diverse set of stakeholders at the table will enable us to reach the clean energy future that we all want. We are happy to join with New York City Council in its pursuit to help uh, combat climate change. And as Con Ed and the Mayor's Office just mentioned, we are co-sponsoring a study with the Mayor's Office to develop those pathways to achieve um, the uh, city's 8050 targets. So these align the, uh, the alignment of these efforts will help us achieve the greenhouse gas reductions we're all hoping to achieve. And while we pursue this goal, we will be looking for ways to reduce carbon emissions in a cost-effective way for our customers. At National Grid, we have already taken concrete steps to move towards a clean energy future, modernizing our energy infrastructure to meet 21st century demand and connecting customers to renewable energy we will, will help us towards the future of an integrated decarbonized energy system. We show our commitment to that future through innovative projects such as REV, that's the Reforming Energy Vision, incorporating cogeneration, gas demand response, smart homes, and geothermal. And the Newtown Creek Renewable Natural Gas Demonstration Project, which is a partnership with the City of New York, and that project is under construction as we speak, and it will be operational later this year that will be taking two feedstocks, wastewater and food waste, to produce renewable energy. Over the years, we have also partnered with New York City and have phased out the use of number six and number four heating oils in approximately 800 buildings, and we are looking at opportunities in the transportation sector as well. 
We have also developed new aggregate data to upload process, leveraging the EPA Portfolio Manager site to make it easier for our customers to obtain their annual aggregate usage data that is to comply with Local Law 84 and Local Law 87. We also continue to play an important role in transforming the heating sector through energy efficiency and oil to gas conversions. Those who convert to natural gas enjoy a convenience, a price discount compared to competing fuel oils and a green benefit that reduces emissions. Each year in New York City and Long Island, we add about 8,000 residential and commercial customers who shift from oil to natural gas. That's the equivalent of pulling 500,000 cars off the road for one year. And we bring, as we bring additional renewable natural gas projects like Newtown Creek and other customer driven projects, we will begin to decarbonize the gas network through which we deliver, which we will deliver energy to our customers. We believe a decarbonized gas network plays a critical role in delivering a low carbon future and that renewable natural gas is an overlooked yet effective option to help decarbonize the heat and transportation sectors. And I want to hang on this uh, for a minute. Um, as I mentioned, we've done a deep dive into the 8050 pathways and what the data is telling us, we need to start decarbonizing the other sectors. Um, and I'll give you some data. In New York State, power generation represents only about 20% of the emissions. So the other 80% of the emissions in the state come from the other sectors. And we are looking as a gas network as a potential way to decarbonize the other sectors. And I can come back to this in a bit, but so I just want to, if there's one thing that you remember from my testimony is that the carbon footprint of the gas network is not static and it is declining. And it can help again achieve the decarbonization of the other sectors of the economy. Shifting to energy efficiency, for nearly a decade, National Grid has provided customers with award-winning energy efficiency programs that have helped save tens of thousands of therms annually, reducing energy use and their carbon footprint. In 2017, we provided more than $20 million in energy efficiency services and incentives to save our customers more than 4 million therms per year. We also offer a variety of rebates and incentives on energy efficient products to help customers save energy and money and we process more than 9,000 customer energy efficiency rebates each year. We are in the process of launching an e-commerce site which will provide customers instant rebates on eligible energy efficiency measures. We are committed to doing more to help our customers make more informed energy choices and develop new energy products and services. We look forward to working with New York City to develop a roadmap to achieve its aggressive greenhouse gas emission targets. All right, I think that's better. All right, thank you, Committee Chair Constantinides and all members and staff of the committee for this opportunity to provide comments on intro 1318. My name is Brian McCabe with NRG Energy. NRG currently owns a diverse mix of large steam and quick start peaking units totaling approximately 2,900 megawatts of generation in the state of New York. To put it in perspective, this is enough generation to power more than 2.3 million homes. NRG also serves over 180,000 retail customers in New York through four of our retail energy brands. We've been a part of the greater New York City community for almost two decades now with our Astoria and Arthur Kill generating units located in Queens and Staten Island. These assets were acquired from Con Edison in 1999. As the chairman's aware, NRG has been actively working to modernize these facilities with new clean technology. NRG's corporate carbon goals are focused on a commitment to real and meaningful carbon reductions. NRG's carbon goals directly align with the ambition of the Paris Climate Agreement and support New York's commitment to the U.S. Climate Alliance. We're pleased that we're already two-thirds of our way to the 2030 goal. At NRG, we're not about putting up roadblocks and preserving the status quo. We're taking action on our own. We want to work with New York City on a path to decarbonization. NRG supports Intro 1318. It's important to analyze the feasibility of deploying renewable resources and energy storage as a substitute for gas-fired generation. As owners and operators of existing in-city gas-fired facilities, we believe we can contribute valuable, valuable information to the study. In fact, we view the addition of energy storage devices paired with renewable supply backed with flexible gas, crucially important 
to the future of our integrated energy company. In our view, reliable and affordable decarbonization requires a for-product future. Energy storage, in combination with controllable demand, will enable energy consumers to proactively manage their load based on real-time energy prices. Finally, the bulk power system continues to need modern, quick-start peaking units to ensure the lights only stay on. NRG remains a strong advocate for achieving decarbonization through market-based solutions. Market-based solutions transfer the risk of performance from ratepayers to companies like NRG who are willing to invest private capital in New York's future. We believe in minimizing ratepayer subsidies and allowing competitive forces to drive innovation, efficiency, and cost reductions to the benefit of ratepayers. It's imperative if we're going to achieve advance advancements in battery storage systems necessary to support deployment on a larger scale. Let's review the primary supply side services needed to run the grid. The first is ensuring supply meets demand. Renewable energy sources play a key role in this service today. Whenever the sun shines and the wind blows, due to, the, due to their zero marginal cost of production, the grid operator prioritizes the use of renewable energy in the supply stack, meeting needs with carbon-free energy. The second is meeting peak demand on the hottest and coldest days of the year. Depending on the duration and size of the peak, Renewable resources coupled with energy uh, storage can meet this need as well. The third is responding to short duration system contingencies. The electric grid must always be ready for an unexpected equipment failure. During a system contingency, quick start units pick up the slack caused by the sudden loss of grid resources. Whether it's a failed con at electrical feeder or a generating facility that abruptly had to come offline, battery storage systems can play a, a role in bridging gaps and resources. However, Batteries can only discharge for a limited time before they need to be recharged, typically four hours at their maximum rated load. Therefore, while batteries are great for quickly responding to short duration events, today's battery technologies have their limitations. The fourth is responding to a long duration event. Uh, you know, fortunately, these types of events do not occur often, but when they do, backup power may be required for an extended period of time. Slide seven and what you're looking at shows the operating history of our Astoria peaking plant over the past couple of years. As you can see, there are quite a number of events that required the Astoria units to operate for greater than four hours. Slide eight also shows the operating profile of NRG's Astoria plant following the recent transformer failure and the nearby electrical substation. The graph shows that a little over one month ago, our Astoria plant was needed to run for 23 continuous hours. There are no battery technologies on the market today that can operate for 23 continuous hours. We conclude that duration is a key consideration when evaluating the use of battery storage as a replacement for quick start peaking units. Battery storage may be the ideal resource to shift renewable energy to meet peak load. However, battery storage may not be the ideal resource to address reliability needs that arise unexpectedly and last for many hours or even days, such as the needs that arose during Hurricane Sandy and Irene or recent major cold snaps. Clearly, the longer the duration of need, the more expensive a battery solution would be. On slide nine, we talk about NRG's recommendations. The feasibility of deploying renewable resources and battery storage systems as a replacement for in-city gas-fired power plants must be carefully evaluated. NRG supports intro 1318, that would result in a report that takes into account a full review of battery storage technologies, their timeline for deployment, and the effect on consumer costs, including low-income customers. We further recommend the analysis include an evaluation of the essential elements of the bulk power system, such as highly efficient, flexible gas-generating resources that both prevent contingencies and aid in the restoration of the electrical grid following extreme weather events. We believe that batteries can play an increasingly important role in meeting electric system needs, but that for the foreseeable future, due to cost and uh, technical limitations, they will need to be paired with some combination of state-of-the-art quick start peaking units in order to address the full range of reliability needs that New York City will face. Respectfully, we offer an amended version of intro 1318 for the committee's consideration. I want to thank the chairman and members of the committee for this opportunity to share our views. All right, so I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna ask some questions and, and folks can sort of jump in here. I guess to the national grid, um, how much of your 
you know, how much power do you transmit is produced by natural gas in the city limits? So Edison has you know, their plant that they have that generates steam. Um, do you have any such plants? National does not own any power plants. You don't own any plants at all? No, except on Long Island. Okay, so on Long Island. So you don't, you don't yeah, so let's just uh, talk about transmission then. Um, what sort of conversation, I'll ask the, this pretty much the same questions I asked kind of the center of you. Uh, I don't want them to, to feel like I'm only picking on them. Um, what conversations are we having with NYSERDA? Uh, what conversations are we having with customers to make those healthy choices? Right? It's not just about reliability, it's about saying, I'm interested in a geothermal technology, but if we're hanging this, this carrot to go to natural gas right. out in front of them, uh, you know, oh, you can save a million dollars by doing this, even though if they come to the table saying we want to do renewable energy, how are we encouraging um, and finding those pathways forward without sort of offering this carrot to go to a fossil fuel? Great. So on the power side, right. I'm not an expert, and we can come back. I know that my colleagues are deeply engaged with NIPA and, and the governor's office about transmission on the electric. So let me just talk about, you know, sort of the perspective I have on the gas to address the products that you just mentioned. So we're thinking really hard about the big picture of the 8050, and as I mentioned, we're doing these new products that you just talked about. Um, so I'll give you an example. So let me just rephrase it, right? The way we think about tackling 8050, and if the way we view it is, is the future of the energy world technology-driven or policy-driven? So the way we view it is that it's technology-driven but policies that sort of provide a support to that framework. Um, and to offer the products to the customers that you mentioned, I'll give you an example of a new product that we're thinking about introducing in our rate case downstate uh, in New York City later this year, would be like a green gas tariff. That is a product that our customers would voluntarily willing to be pay, a, pay a premium to decarbonize heat. And the reason we're offering it it's sort of having listened to our customers, right? Our customers are saying we have very aggressive, um, this is mostly universities and large companies saying we have very aggressive targets to reduce our emissions. We know how to do it on the power side. We go buy solar and wind. We don't know how to do it on heat. So that was listening to our customers. And we've also found out that there is supply out there. So the way the utility would play a role in that, and, and this will be again in, the, in an upcoming rate case, is to be the matchmaker between supply and demand and doing demonstration projects. So Newtown Creek was one of them we started 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but there are other ones in the pipeline that we're looking at to further decarbonize the gas network. But uh, if I'm following you correctly, you're gonna have your customers pay a premium to do that. So it's, it's, you can have this, but it's gonna cost you more. So on the green gas tariff, we are offering to a voluntary, uh, it, so this will be a, customers will be voluntarily to weigh a premium, but I think the broader conversation is to look at of all of the options to decarbonize every sector. So, and that's a conversation that's ongoing with all of the stakeholders. So we're not making that decision saying this is, you know, we, we'll do that through rate cases, but there isn't, there's obviously a stakeholder process. Um, so when I'm, and I, when I was talking about this product, but my point is we're looking at the technologies that will help us to decarbonize heat and other sectors and we're bringing those to the tables and, and engaging stakeholders saying, hey, there's other solutions you ought to be thinking about. Um, and, and we're also thinking about that we can use the gas network as a very large battery over time if there's more offshore wind and a lot of generation capacity. So in a nutshell, as we are bringing to the table and we're using our ability as a company to do demonstration projects that bring really innovative projects and at the same time engaging the policymakers at the state level, NYSERDA, the mayor's office, to think about the larger picture of how we address climate change. So you're saying that the gas network can be utilized to bring power from wind upstate, from Long Island, that that's something that can be utilized in the future? Correct. The concept is known as power to gas, um, and, and this is already happening in Germany. It's actually happening in California where they are curtailing renewable uh, energy. It's happening in Colorado. They're curtailing offshore wind. So again, we're thinking ahead, and we're seeing a future that there will be times, and as the mayor's office just mentioned in their testimony, which referred to the governor's goal, if New York City has nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035, there will be times 
that, that power will have nowhere to go. So we're thinking about how do you take that excess renewable electricity, and again, concept known of power to gas, and convert that to gas, and then use the gas system like a giant battery, essentially, to provide that solution to decarbonize other segments. Okay. Um, what we'll come back and talk about it in more detail. I know this uh, yeah, I'm, time, I'm, because I mean, I have some real trouble with gas infrastructure because I mean, fracked gas is, is and, and natural gas is still a fossil fuel, right? So I, I have any, I have challenges with the mm -hmm. proliferation of this type of infrastructure. I mean, what are we, in, what investments are we making uh, in renewables and battery storage on the NRG, uh, on a national grid side? I mean. So downstate we're a gas utility. Right, um, so you only gas, yeah. So we, you know, we don't have that ability to do on the power side, but I do know that my, my colleagues in the other jurisdictions in Massachusetts, they are doing um, things on battery, and I, I'm not fully aware of them, and we can come back to you and talk about that. So again, I wear my hat downstate focusing on the gas network. And to your earlier point, um, we're looking at decarbonizing the product itself. So what I'm referring to is whether it's Newtown Creek, a landfill, a food mm -hmm. waste, we're looking at upstate potentially, you know, uh, a dairy project using a livestock manure to actually produce gas. So we're looking at a future where the commodity that's flowing through the gas network is actually not a fossil fuel. So we begin to decarbonize the gas network. I mean, look, I think we need to use um our organic waste in a different way, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think that makes a lot of sense to turn it, you know, to turn that, that's going to landfill and turn that into something that can be potentially beneficial to everyone. I, I, I applaud you guys for looking, and I think we need to do more of that. Um, but I do have trouble with, you know, like I said before, more fracked gas coming into New York City. I hear about the Williams pipeline, I hear about other gas infrastructure being put into place, and that's not where I am. Uh, you know, we need to be, coming up with reliable solutions in the long term that are not fossil fuel based, that are bringing in, that are creating renewable energy and moving that renewable energy to the place it needs to go, not building that type of technology. Um, so thinking about uh, power plants, uh, you know, NRG, you talked about your solutions and what you're looking at. Uh, what are you, what are, how, many, how much emissions uh, are, does your plant in Astoria currently have? I don't have the answer to that question here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer many of my questions then. Okay. Um, you know, I think you're here. So I'm going to ask, uh, you know, looking at Professor Bratsby's and, and sort of your thoughts about these, these plants that were cited, these foisted upon our communities over time. Uh, every time they click on, they're a source of pollution in those communities. Uh, just, sort of, all the testimony you've heard today, sort of, if you want to sort of expand your thoughts on, on some of the things you're thinking about. Well, I think the question you just asked about what are the emissions from the plant is really um, gets to the core of what the communities are experiencing. Um, I've had some trouble getting data on some of these plants, um, in part because it goes back a you know, in time before everything was routinely computerized, but um, we know for certain that there were violations in Staten Island. So whatever the, um, the emissions are supposed to be, at least at one set of installations, we know they were significantly more, so much so that there was a, um, an enforcement. Um, you know, we're talking about places where people live, and we have, we in the city, have historically consistently shunted these uses to poor communities and communities of color. And those communities bear the burden of the power generation that all of us need and all of us use. And that's wrong. We're all in this together and looking, um, somebody said earlier that we need to look at what makes sense in the system in terms of where we're gonna locate new facilities, and that is guaranteed to just drive more polluting activity into the already overburdened, vulnerable communities. We have to rethink the whole thing. We have to start from what kind of a system do we want to have and then make that happen. That makes a lot of sense. I think it's a lot of sense. I mean, we need to start, we need to sort of 
not to take everything and throw it out the window, but think about it in a completely new way. And, you know, we've thought about things. The, th the most frustrating thing I hear in government is that we've always done it this way and this is the way we always should do it, right? And I think it's time for us to start thinking about things differently and saying we don't ever, we don't need to cite, look, think, about, think about how systems work now and how we can fit in those systems and we just start thinking about it differently. Um, so, you know, with that, I'll, I want to, uh, I could go all day, but I, I won't, because I know we have to vacate this room by one o'clock. <laughs> so I think there are more panels as well, but I want to thank you all for uh, your testimonies today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one panel left? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we actually we only have one panel left. Oh, I could have gone longer. Um, so, uh, Eric Wolfman, uh, Food and Water Watch. Uh, Rachel Spector, uh, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Uh, Catherine Skopik, uh, representing the, herself and also the Sierra Club. Uh, Eva Leave uh, Bard, um, sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong, uh, 350nyc.org. Uh, and Phil uh, Venaria, who says he's representing himself. Since we start on this side in the last panel, we'll start on, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, th I have a, a written statement, so I think I'm just going to submit that. Okay, that's uh, fine. For the uh, transcript of the record, but I also just want to say, uh, my um, the this is a lot of technical talk, and it, it eludes me. Uh, I definitely appreciate it, though. Um, I myself came because I have a personal conne connection to uh, Con Edison hazards. I'm the first victim and survivor of stray voltage. Mm -hmm. From uh, I had an incident in August of 1997, and my concern, of course, is probably a little more visceral than the every uh, the things that I've heard beforehand, and. Um, uh, so I think this is almost kind of global in that regard. I'm looking at uh, not just this incident of the arc mm -hmm. in um, December, but the decades of problems. And it's an ongoing thing. We seem to keep start. Something happens, and then it stops, and the cycle begins again. And we're never getting anywhere with really uh, getting to the root of the problem, which is the troubled infrastructure. And um, I think that's the gist of really what, and, and I have personal reflections in here, having dealt with Con Edison, um, having legal victories against them, and I just know that there's, you know, you can put on a happy face or, or have all kinds of public relations confections, but you really, but the public really wants to see something good happen, something correct happen to protect them. I understand your point of view. Uh, what more did went on than what we heard in the papers about no damages, no injuries? Now you're saying that buildings shook and stuff like that. That wasn't a widespread information. Was there, any after, was there any other aftermath? And how will this really be followed up? Uh, this is really important because, it, you know, it, this is a down-to-earth reaction. And that means most people will share it because most people just aren't coming at this from a technical point of view. I really think that it's time for the city and the state to step up and uh, take some sort of control of the situation with Con Edison and make them really make a timely, pl concrete plan to improve the infrastructure, modernize it. So everything that everyone else has said about uh, decarbonization and cleaner energy really does uh, apply, I appreciate that. I think this could be helpful to you in just understanding the workings of Con Edison from a personal level. So I, I'd, I'll appreciate seeing this. All right, definitely, now give it to the right. Sergeant in Arms. Thank you very much. Oh, you can stay there, he's gonna come get it. Oh, sure. no, we're full service here. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs>
could I get a haircut? <laughs> We're full service here. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't read. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Weltman, and I'm a Brooklyn-based senior organizer for Food and Water Watch. I would like to express our strong support for intro number 1318. Five years ago, New York banned fracking, yet we continue to bear the burden of fossil fuel infrastructure, including pipelines and power plants that transport and burn fracked gas. In fact, even as we join Chairman Constantinidis in trying to shutter the city's gas-fired plants, we are fending off a proposed new project, as you mentioned, the Williams Pipeline, that would ship frack gas off Staten Island, Coney Island, and the Rockaways. And we're also trying to stop a frack gas power plant in New Jersey's Meadowlands that would send all its power to the city. We are hearing a lot these days about Green New Deals, and it's a nice sounding slogan, but this is a bill that would make a real substantive impact in moving us off fossil fuels to 100% renewable energy. The science is already clear and it's becoming even more clear. We must make a rapid transition off fossil fuels or risk climate catastrophe, including more tragedies like Superstorm Sandy. It's also clear that natural gas is not a bridge fuel. It's a gangplank to climate chaos. And when produced by fracking, it poisons our water and communities. We need to move fast. And this bill, with its 2030 timeline, is a tremendous credit to the bold vision of its chief sponsor. We need to move fast, and we can move fast. Renewable energy technologies, along with battery storage systems, are advancing at a rapid pace. We can accelerate these developments by establishing ambitious goals like this one. Food and Water Watch urges the Council to pass this bill. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. My name is Catherine. Oh, make sure your button's on, Catherine. My name is Catherine Skopik. I am speaking as an individual, educator, parent and am, and am a member of several environmental organizations including Sierra Club and Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, IMEC. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, for presenting this amendment regarding a feasibility study to transition our gas-fired power plants to renewable energy with battery storage. As most of us are aware, Transition to renewable energy is needed immediately, as soon as possible. And by the way, I might make a suggestion here that of our 21 power plants, that the data from each one be compiled and we begin with the worst offender, the power plant that has the most greenhouse gas emissions, correct that one, and then go to the next and the next and the next as a plan for getting to where we need to be ASAP. Our planet Earth is about four and a half billion years old, a record reflecting almost one million years worth of 100,000 year cycles of climate, revealed changes in ice volume that indicate periods of rapid, several thousand years, melting of ice sheets that end a glacial cycle and begin an interglacial. This is from the Ice Chronicles, a book by Paul Maresky and Frank White. At no point did the level of carbon dioxide, CO2, go above 300 parts per million, or ppm. In mid-2018, we were at 410 ppm. The present concentration is the highest in the last 800,000 and possibly the last 20 million years. Methane gas is about 80 times more greenhouse gas producing than a CO2. We are in the Anthropocene epoch. These are man-made or person-made changes. So although our moment is but a blip in Earth's time, this unique blip could make or break life as we know it on our planet. 
The IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, shows we have a rapidly closing window of a little over 10 years to drastically reduce our burning of fossil fuels if we are to survive. As we have already caused this crisis, we can halt and uncause it. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, and New York City Council for moving this crisis towards solution, stopping the burning of fo gas, fossil fuel. Let us know how and what we can do to help you in this transition to renewable energy. Never has so much depended on so few. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Next up. Thank you, Chair Constantinides and members of the committee. My name is Rachel Spector. I'm the director of the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. For uh, nearly three decades, our program has worked to address disproportionate environmental harms in New York City's low-income communities and communities of color. In fact, in the early 2000s, we represented the Sunset Park community group Uprose in a challenge to the siting of new gas-fired peaker plants um, that folks have talked about today, the Power Now plan. Um, as you also may have guessed, that was unfortunately an unsuccessful legal challenge. Um, but we do believe that there is now an opportunity to right the wrong that happened. If we want to avoid catastrophic climate change and meet the city's 80 by 50 goals, the governor's goal to make New York, New York State electricity generation greenhouse gas neutral by 2040, we must start thinking about how to transition away from power plants that burn fossil fuels. So it is smart to start now with this study of how we can replace the city's power plants with renewable energy sources and storage, as intro 1318 requires, and come up with a plan to do so. But power plants emit not just carbon dioxide, but a host of co-pollutants that are harmful to the health of residents that live in their shadows. Most of New York City's fossil fuel power plants are located in communities of color and historically working class, particularly waterfront neighborhoods. Many are located adjacent to large public housing developments, as has been discussed. These power plants emit nitrogen oxides, a potent precursor to ozone and smog, and particulate matter, which leads to asthma, respiratory conditions, and heart disease. The study mandated by Intro 1318 should also examine public health benefits from re replacing power plants and should pay particular attention to taking peaker plants offline on a faster timeline. There are 16 peaker plants in New York City located in environmental justice communities. These plants fire up when electricity demand is higher than what baseload power plants can supply. Often this is in the midst of the hottest summer days when air, conditions are, air conditioners are blasting around the city and when air quality is already extremely poor, particularly in the neighborhoods where these plants are located. Due to their inter intermittent nature, under regulation, technology that allows them to fire up quickly, New York City's peaker plants are far more polluting than baseload power plants. In a recent study, the New York Public Service Commission estimated that New York City area peakers emit, emit twice as much carbon dioxide per unit of electricity generated than regular power plants, and up to 20 times as many nitrogen oxides. The good news is that battery storage can eliminate the need for peaker plants, since stored energy can be deployed when, electri when electricity demand peaks. Using storage to take downstate peaker plants offline is already contemplated by NYSERDA's energy storage roadmap, and studies, multiple studies have shown that energy storage is now an affordable and feasible alternative to peaker plants. It can also have additional benefits like job creation and community resiliency. Intro 1318 is an important step forward in planning for a transition to a renewable energy economy here in New York City. We urge that the bill specify additional measures to be studied, including public health, equity, economic development, and resiliency benefits of a transition to renewables and storage, and include a focus on replacing peaker plants on a faster timeline. We look forward to working with the council further on this effort. Next up. My name is Eva Lee Baird, and I'm testifying 
4 intro 1318 on behalf of the local climate group 350nyc.org. We're a grassroots organization that depends on volunteers to advocate for political and social solutions to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions caused by burning fossil fuel. We're very pleased that Councilmember Konstantinidis has the vision to introduce this bill before the City Council. Phasing out local gas-fired power plants is critical to achieving the rapid reduction in New York City's greenhouse gas emissions necessary to reach Mayor de Blasio's target of 40 percent reduction by 2030. The NYC local plants are peaker plants, and although they are online for only a few hours a day, they are expensive and dirty. The total greenhouse gas emissions for N NYC was 52 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2016, of which 13 million tons of carbon dioxide was from electricity generation. Current emissions per kilowatt hour from the local gas power plants are disproportionately high and account for approximately 50 percent of the emissions from all electricity sources. Uh, that's in the roadmap. For example, the Raven Woods Generating Station burns 3,264 gallons of oil per year <clears throat> and was ranked as the state's largest carbon polluter in 2014. For the last three years, there's been no significant drop in greenhouse gas emissions in the city. We're not even halfway to our 2030 target, and most of the reduction since 2005 has been due to cleaner electricity entering the grid from generation upstate. Progress on improving energy efficiency has been slow, although this is expected to accelerate with the enactment of the Building Energy Efficiency Bill, Intro 1253. Intro 1318 requests a study of the feasibility of storing electricity generated from renewable sources using batteries to replace local gas fire power plants. The New York State Department of Public Service and NYSERDA have recently published the New York State Energy uh, Storage Roadmap, which will be a valuable resource in the planned study for New York. That report found that those units in New York City that operated for the shortest periods of time were uh, the dirtiest and most expensive to operate and would begin and would become candidates for replacement by batteries as early as 2022 based on market pricing alone, excluding externalities. In addition to the significant greenhouse gas emissions, the city power plants emit sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter that contribute to ozone formation. New York City air is not clean. We're ranked number 11 and number 14 dirtiest for high ozone lem uh, levels high, uh, and high particulate matter, respectively, in the nation. Western Queens is known as Asthma Alley, and air pollution levels are higher in Astoria and Long Island City than the rest of the borough. Avoidable emergency room visits for adults in Astoria are 30 percent higher than in the rest of Queens. The financial benefits of reducing health impacts must be taken into account by the Commission. In conclusion, we applaud the Council for considering this study, and when the prudent path is established, urge them to begin to phase out the dirty power plants as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, you know, I, you know, I'm going to date myself here, but I'm, you know, this, I feel like this is Gilligan's Island, right? We're on these, these plants are on a three hour tour. We were, <laughs> we were promised three years and we're now 18 years in. Um, so it's time for those speakers to close and, and close quickly. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say is I appreciate all of your time. Uh, you know, someone handed me a button about three months ago that we are the asteroid. And I thought that was probably one of the more poignant things I had seen is that, you know, the, that you know, we're, this time around, we're the ones doing the, making the major impact. So I appreciate um, you speaking truth today and all the advocacy, advocacy that you do uh, individually and amongst the other groups that you have. Uh, so I look forward to partnering with you. Thank you for the good ideas on how we can amend the bill. 
uh, I appreciate your time, and we'll definitely take that into consideration as we move forward. So I appreciate you guys being here today. Um, so seeing no one else, uh, I want to thank uh, all those who testified today. Um, I just want to make sure that I thank uh, our staff, uh, you know, Samara Swanston, our great legislative attorney, uh, Nadia Johnson, our senior policy analyst, uh, uh, Ricky uh, Chawla, am I getting that right, saying it right, uh, as our new policy analyst, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, our senior finance analyst, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, my legislative counsel, and uh, Terrence Cullen, my communications director. I want to thank, of course, our speaker, Corey Johnson, uh, for working with us on this legislation and allowing us to have this hearing. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks to talk about wastewater treatment. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here today and testifying, and we look forward to moving forward uh, intro 1318 as part of a greener, uh, renewable New York City. Thank you.